I have to say, it's been kind of fun going through some psalms that I haven't spent a lot of time with. Um, just for your information, we're in Psalm 107 today, if you want to open up Bibles, and we'll be reading most of it in parts this morning, but let's ask God to, to bless his word today. Lord, we give you thanks and praise, not only for who you are, but Lord, for your presence in our life. Lord, for these words written, Lord, centuries ago, Lord, from the psalmist, Lord, who recognized your presence in the lives of many, many individuals, and Lord, your power in our lives in so many ways. And so, God, we ask for your blessing upon your word, Lord, your word that is certainly relevant today as it was thousands of years ago, because, God, you are an unchangeable God, and you're a God who continues to walk with through your people. So, Lord, walk with us through your word written upon our hearts. Lord, uh, change us and mold us and make us by the truths revealed in them. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Well, Psalm 107 is a unique psalm in that um, uh, it's, it's kind of a story or a blessing of God in different groups of people, in three different groups of people. And so we're going to look at these different groups of people in here or situations in which people find themselves. It's not like we're one group and not the other, but we find ourselves in different situations throughout our life. And this wonderful psalm is a psalm of thanks, giving thanks to God for his work in his people. And so we're not going to start in verse 1, of course. Pastor Scott likes to do things a little different. We're going to start at verse 10. In verse 10, Psalm 107, verse 10, and it's talking about this group of people that I refer to as prisoners in affliction and in irons. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Prisoners in affliction and in irons. For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. This is the first group today. Those that are in affliction, they're prisoners, rebelling against the words of God, spurning God's counsel, His instructions, His, his rule book. So afflicted, we are all afflicted in one way or the other, right? The question is, does your affliction imprison you? Are you imprisoned by your affliction? Now, the psalmist is probably writing about incarceration, maybe the exile, the Jews being taken to Babylon or one of the exiles. They're not sure exactly when it was written. But our afflictions imprison us in our lives as well, too, even though we're not in chains and we're not in a dungeon or, or sitting somewhere we don't want to be. But our afflictions imprison us. And the question is, do we choose to allow those afflictions to imprison us? Some today, the vernacular would say, does it define us? Are we defined by our afflictions? Are you defined by your family history? powerful impact upon who we are and how we act? Are we defined by our society? Western culture, right? Here we are. And are we defined as by our Midwest, West Central Minnesota culture that we live in? Absolutely. Yeah. Are we defined by our genetic makeup? It's in my genes. Absolutely. We are impacted by the genes that we have, you know, balding hair and whatever else goes on. Actually, I could probably use these glasses here too, you know, They're part of my genetic makeup. There, that's what I'm supposed to preach on, right? Are we defined by the evil around us in all its forms? Diseases and calamities, again, just look at the headlines in the newspapers these days, right? So we're all afflicted. We're, we're all impacted by these things in our life. Family history, society, genetic makeup, the world around us, and all those things. But the question is, are we imprisoned by those things? Are we incarcerated for disobeying not only God's laws, but the laws of society? Right? Uh, did you have to pay the speeding ticket? You ever get fired? Ever been incarcerated? Are you familiar with corporations that pay the fines 
instead of adhering to the rules of the trade or nations committing crimes against humanity. Right? Imprisoned by our circumstances. And we are somewhat defined by the physical world around us. We are Midwestern U.S. citizens. Right? The question is, are we imprisoned by that? Do we ignore his word? I have it under control, and the world's norms are just fine for us. This week with the youth on Wednesday night, we've been talking about sex and dating. The world's norms are, yeah, go ahead and live with each other and, you know, it feels good, do it. It's like, those aren't God's norms, right? Are we defined by the world around us or are we defined by God's word and his counsel? We do find ourselves in personal and public jails. We find ourselves, right, incarcerated by the situations around us when we not only ignore God's direction, but actually do the opposite. We all know the two-year-old in all of us, like Finding Nemo. Not looking. Oh my gosh! Nemo's swimming out the sea! <gasps> Nemo! What do you think you're doing? You're gonna get stuck out there and I'm gonna have to get you before another fish does. Get back here! I said get back here now! Stop! You take one more move, mister. D don't you dare! If you put one fin on that boat, are you listening to me? Don't touch the boat. Nemo! You touch the boat. Right? I mean, that's the image that God has here of, of, you know, not only not listening to God's word, but doing exactly opposite what he says, right? Don't touch that boat. Smack. I just love that scene. Yeah. We can become prisoners in our affliction, in our irons. Not only, by not only disregarding God's word, but actually choosing to do the opposite. That's the first group of people, prisoners in affliction and in irons for the impact of the world around them. The second group of people, verse 17, if you're following with me. Yep, we're skipping a few verses there. Second group of people, 17, verse 17 and 18. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. So this first group was those that are in affliction from the world around us, not listening to God's word. Now we've got this group of people that are suffering affliction because they are actually touching the boat. Right? They're actually sinning against God's word. Fools through their sinful ways. Not because of who they are, genetic makeup, or born in staples, but this is choosing to not follow God's ways and because of their iniquities, because of their sin, suffered affliction. God's laws, God's direction, it's not an all obey or else situation. Many of God's commands are for our protection. We're fools not to follow God's commands is what the psalmist writes. Don't we all agree? We're fools not to follow that. Old Testament dietary laws. We all know if you leave the chicken on the counter too long, right, things begin to grow on it and you don't want to eat it. Trichinosis, we don't get trichinosis. It's so rare these days, right? The parasite larva migrate and embed in your muscles. Is that enough? Okay, yeah, we, yeah. Yuck, right. And then if you get trichinosis and it's, there's no cure today. You're stuck with these things in your muscles. Yeah, we want to avoid that, yeah. We primarily get this disease from eating wild game or pork not properly cooked. God's dietary laws were to protect the people. I don't want you getting sick, yeah. 
We all know if you leave the fish out too long, you get salmonella, parasites. Yep. We all know the sexual morality laws, right? Wait till you have a partner and have sex with one person for the rest of your life, and you're not going to get name the disease, right? HIV, 89% of HIV patients are caused by sexual contact, right? That's 89%, eight more percent by injecting drugs, IV use, right? So that's 97% of HIV disease is from illegal drug use or sex with lots of people. Did you know in 2019, 2.6 million new cases of HIV in the world, right? New cases, new cases. Why does God have laws about sex? He doesn't want us to suffer the affliction for our iniquities. Turn our, uh, turn our eyes to methamphetamine, develop psychosis, loss of appetite, anxiety, confusion, violence, alters your brain structures, so that you can't make decisions properly, impairs your ability to suppress habitual behaviors that have become useless or counterproductive. Let me say that again. Meth, what it does is it, where do you go? Suppresses behaviors that have become useless or counterproductive. I'm doing it and it doesn't make sense why I'm doing it, right? What's another word for that in our text? We're fools, right? Doing stuff that doesn't make any sense. Fools through their sinful ways. Do you think God's word is pertinent today? Wow. Second group of individuals here in Psalm 107 are those that sin. They don't use the brain that God gave them, right? And they suffer because of it. Illness and self-destruction has become so common in the world around us. And we're all subject to this. Romans 7, 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I would agree with the law that the law is good. So it's no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Right? Those were Paul's words to Rome. Not this is Paul. You got Paul on the pedestal, which we should, right? I mean, I mean, not Jesus' pedestal, but I mean, here is a faithful man of God writing, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. This is the second group of people. Fools through their sinful ways. Skip ahead, 23. Second, third group of people here. We're, we're doing okay time-wise. Businesses taken down to the depths. Uh, we're going to get some headlines here this morning. Verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Now, I know we're in Minnesota. We're landlocked. There are not a lot of sailors in Thomastown. But 120 miles away, we have this great port of Duluth. Lots of sailors in Duluth. And... The storms that he's talking about are storms of people doing business back in those days. He's talking about physical storms, but we apply it to our spiritual storms in our life and the world around us. Now, the storm of COVID-19 a couple years ago, the ports of the world became bottlenecks to businesses. We didn't have huge waves and seas. We just had ports that you couldn't get a ship into. 
The maritime workers couldn't travel internationally, fewer workers due to illnesses, inability to move goods on land. It's still pretty hard to build a home today and have a set schedule. Don't the rights know that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when is the next component going to be here? I don't know. A couple of weeks, a couple of months, yeah. Will the components be available? And when will they be available? It still haunts us through this COVID-19 thing that we had. So doing business, which we all do, without the Lord, the seas are stormy. How about the banking industry today, huh? Think there's some stormy seas in our businesses around us? Is this, isn't this amazing? Uh -huh. Silicon Valley Bank failed. Okay. The banking market then plummeted a week later. Government bails out Silicon Valley Bank. Other banks showing up, showing up some of the smaller banks. A week later, Signature Bank failed. These are not small names in the banking industry. What a week here. Well, anything over $250,000, your retirement stuff, not guaranteed. Harder to get a loan. Anybody here might be in the housing market soon. It might be really hard to get a loan. The recession is now more likely. The business world boat has been rocked. Stock market crashes, housing market crashes, banking industry crashes. We've all seen this in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And what happens? The suicide rate goes up. The suicide rate goes up. It's amazing. Psalmist writes it this way. The courage melts away. We are at wit's end. When that in which we place our hope rocks and is plummeted to the bottom of the ocean. When all that you have your hope in is gone, what is left? And for many, the answer is nothing. There's nothing left. Well, this is a psalm of thanks. Let's go back to the first group. The prisoners in affliction and irons. The psalmist writes, in verse 13, going back, these are those that are in affliction and irons when we find ourselves defined by our circumstances, when we've rebelled against God's word, when we find ourselves in prisons of our own making or society's making, there is someone that still loves us. If we go all the way back to verse 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And his love is unconditional, even for the afflicted and those imprisoned, and sometimes those rightfully so, in verse 13. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. It's the cry of the heart that brings God's redemption. It's our turning to God that brings us out of the darkness, even from the shadow of death. It's the cry of our heart that moves God to break the chains that have bound us. The chains of your family situation, your genetic background, the society in which you live, the evil around us is no match for the all-loving God, the one Lord, the one Deliverer. And when we have been delivered and set free, we proclaim, may we all say the words, thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. You'll see this refrain in the text in each of these groups, and we'll repeat them again. Fools through sinful ways, healed and delivered from destruction. For the sinners, that would be all of us, yeah. We find someone that loves us in our sin. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
when death comes knocking at our door, our heart may turn to the Lord. And he is there to heal and deliver. Consider the thief on the cross. Jesus hanging there with two thieves. The one thief acknowledging his sin, accepting his punishment of death for his misdeeds in his life, and seeing the righteousness hanging on the cross next to him, turns to Jesus and says, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. His final words in life. And our God, the God of the psalmist and the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, looks to him and says, surely today you'll be with me in paradise. Even in his sin, hanging on that cross, repentant in his last dying breath, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Verse 20, he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. That man on the cross was delivered from eternal destruction. When we have been healed by God, when we've been forgiven by Christ and delivered from death itself, we proclaim, thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Third group, the businesses. You still have the banking crisis in your mind? It's amazing, isn't it? These amazingly powerful, rich businesses and things and just taken down in a day. Just gone, right? We got no money. Yeah. When we find ourselves with misplaced hope and messed up priorities in our personal and family and our business lives, it frequently goes unnoticed until the unthinkable happens. Right? It goes unnoticed until the unthinkable happens. Maybe unthinkable is not the right word. We've all seen it. I mentioned all the different kinds of financial crises we've had and, and housing crises and health crises and the unthinkable is gonna happen. Any business owner knows that the market and the business can all change in a day. It can literally change in a second. Any family member can recall a recent family tragedy. And any individual knows that this world offers no guarantees. And when those unthinkable or thinkable things happen, no matter how much we're at fault, there is someone that still loves us. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. His love is unconditional. Even for those that have placed all hope and every priority on business or family or on self. And then in the midst of the storms of, the life, storms of those lives, verse 29, turning to God, he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad when the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. That's not a word I use in my language very often, right? Haven. Think of the haven of rest quartet. But, oh, isn't that a beautiful word? That haven, that sanctuary, that place where we are protected and felt loved and appreciated. This is for those that have their priorities all messed up. This is for those whose hope is in this world and the financial institutions and in family and in friends and <sighs> when those are taken away, when the heart turns to God, he stills the storms and the waves are hushed and he brings us to our desired haven the longings of our heart. When we have been protected, 
when we have found our home in the Lord, we proclaim, thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. So we've got these three groups of individuals or three circumstances in our own lives. Afflicted by the world, afflicted due to sin, afflicted due to misplaced hope. And the closing of this psalm wraps it all up, 43. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Attend to the impact of the world around you. Attend to your own sinfulness and attend to where is your hope truly placed? The world got you down. Has sin chained you? Are you disappointed by misplaced hope? 43b, the psalmist closes, let us consider the steadfast love of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, when we recall what you endured in the world as you came to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, certainly knowing affliction, affliction of the evil in the world around you, and even living that righteous life, suffering and dying on that cross. God, we bow in reverence to your willingness to do that. Lord, to know our pain. Lord, so that when we recognize what is going on inside of us, Lord, that is not in tune with your word, Lord, that is rebellious of your instruction and guidance to us. Lord, that you are willing to take us back. Lord, that that love never fails. Lord, when we are willing to turn our hearts to you, God, you are always there to receive us. And not only receive us, Lord, but to heal us from those infirmities. Lord, not only to call us your sons and your daughters, but Lord, to deliver us from those things, those chains which have bound us. Lord, deliver us from the illnesses, God, that impact us. Lord, to deliver us, Lord, from Lord, the tragedies of family background. And Lord, that is why we call you Redeemer. For you redeem us from the world around us. Lord, you bring us into a greater hope. A hope that is not bound by this world or this place or this time. But Lord, we have a hope in all eternity. God, that with you, Lord, that all things are possible. Lord, that with you, you can take these chains that bind us. Lord, you can not only break those chains, but God, use those circumstances for your good in the lives of others. Lord, you can take our sinfulness and in forgiving us, God, you make us righteous in your eyes. Lord, to go forth, not by our power, but Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit in us, moving us and making us being your ambassadors to the world around us that needs to know that there is a living hope, that there is something greater than the world's banking financial institutions. Lord, there is strong, something stronger than ballistic missiles. Lord, there is something more constant than friends and family. So Lord, we come to you giving you thanks and praise for who you are a God of love. God, we come to you giving you thanks and praise that you are a God who loves us still in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our circumstances. And Lord, that you are a God who blesses us, we your people. Lord, to be your people, to be that light to the world and to be that hope of the nations. So move us and make us, we pray. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us consider this man who is willing to die for us. Let us consider this God who is willing to come for us. Number 220, Man of Sorrows.